Everybody say God's response. If there's any subject that hasn't been visited enough, I think it's this one. Because you know, the God of the Bible is active. We do not serve a dormant, inactive God. God's moving. Now, I won't, be, I won't be popular. It won't be popular for me to say this, but I'm going to say it. The Lord is speaking to our state. Floods on the east and fire in the west. Judgment. North Carolina. North Carolina. The state where the majority of the voters vote against common sense legislation. A woman is a fool who wants a man in the bathroom with her that she's not married to. And especially if he's so kooky that he self-identify as a woman. I'm kind to call him kooky. He's messed up. I don't feel like using euphemisms today. That's demonic. That's demonic. And you know it's messed up because then these guys are still sexually turned on to women. Bruce Jenner, I hope, you, I hope one day you can see him in person. Coach, how tall are you? You're 6'9". Good God almighty. Oh uh, who's 6'5"? Come here, man. Come here. Come here. Come here, Archer. He's 6'5". Coach, you're too tall. 6'9", he keeps going up, 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 up. Look at this big guy right here. Six feet, five inches tall. Now, this is, and this is not in my notes. I, I, this man is the height of Caitlin. <laughs> and, and a man, like, could you imagine Archie? Brother Archer standing here with a wig on and a short skirt with man knees. See, women knees, you know, that's a, di that's a, that's a different game. But a man's knees, say amen. I thought the brother would say amen. And men feet. Talking about my name is Aaliyah, not Archie. Could you imagine that? Now that's how big Bruce is. And he's walking around, calling himself Caitlin. But I tell you what happened when he had, when he had surgery, uh, he went completely crazy because the first thing he did when he came out from under anesthesia is he pulled up the covers and looked down <laughs> and made sure they left everything down there untouched. Thank you, sir. Give him a hand. Yeah, he did. And Bruce will tell you, Bruce will tell you that he is still sexually attracted to women. So what Bruce did was he went through all that trouble to become a lesbian. I mean, I mean, that's bad. I mean, you're already a man. Praise the Lord. You already, I mean, you've won the lottery. If you sexually attracted to women, God already taking care of everything. You can go through all that. Facial softening surgeries. Cut, made his nose smaller. Raised his cheekbones. Did something to his neck. 
There was nothing that could help his hands. <laughs> nor feet. That's right. And after all that is done, had the Adam's apple shaved down so it would look more smooth like a woman's. And uh, after all that, still won't have sex with a woman. But he wants to be able to go to the bathroom with you. And you railed against that kind of law. And oh, we, we need business in our state. We can't, we can't have that. We're losing jobs. Well, they forgot to tell Forbes. They forgot to tell Forbes magazine. Forbes magazine gave the top 25 or top 50 best states to do business. Rank number two on the list, North Carolina. God is responding yes, sir. Yes. to our rejection of him. Yes. Yes. Amen. God responds to our prayers. God responds to our life situations. God responds to our world. Generally speaking, when approaching the, the subject of God's response, we must fully understand a few things about God. Number one, let's start with this. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. I'll just read it to you to save time. Remember this about God. When he gets ready to respond to you after you've told the Lord what's on your mind. Remember the Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. God's thoughts are superior. The Bible teaches that the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and that the weakness of God is stronger than man. We are not God. Praise the Lord. He's superior. Now, my thoughts, email, may not be your thoughts, but that doesn't mean my thoughts are superior to your thoughts. And it doesn't mean that your thoughts are inferior to my thoughts. They may, be the, they may not be the same, but yours may be better than mine. Mine may be better than yours. It depends on what we're thinking about. But when it's God, there's no equivalence. As the heavens are above the earth, so are his thoughts above our thoughts and his ways above our ways. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, you find a gem of a passage. And it says this, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Isn't that something? We look at a thing, and God looks at a thing, but God doesn't see it the way we see it. Isn't that amazing? And a man really gets good sight when he learns to look through the lenses of God. For the God of the Bible see things as they are. And his sight is always Correct. After understanding that his thoughts are superior to ours and his sight and his ways are superior to ours, we need to know that God sees everything perfectly at all times. There's no haze. There's no sunlight that affect God's view. Darkness, doesn't matter. Light, doesn't matter. 
In fact, Psalms 139 and verse 12 says, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So you can join the wicked Wilson Pickett and say, I'm going to wait till the midnight hour. But God sees just as good at midnight as he see at noon day. The night and the light are alike to him. He has perfect sight. Another thing to consider the next time you talk to the Lord and we're awaiting his response is consider this. The God of the Bible has perfect knowledge. His thoughts are superior to ours. His ways are superior to ours. Uh, he can see perfectly at all times. We can't. And he has perfect knowledge. The Bible says this about the God of the Bible. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. God knows at the onset of a thing how it's going to work out. He'll tell you at the beginning of a thing, I'm going to do thus and so. I was sent a prophecy, and I was not, for full disclosure, sent this prophecy until the day after the election. The prophecy was uh, someone on, uh, I not met this person before, but this individual said in 2011 that the next president of the United States, uh, now, now, now the election uh, was in 2016, November the 8th. This prophecy was given in 2000, I think, 11, that after President Obama, the prophet said that the next president, and I didn't notice that after the election, you better be glad I didn't, would actually be, and he named him by name, Donald Trump. You want me to send it to you now, don't you? I, I heard the groan, because mm. I know for somebody the Lord told you. I called one guy, the guy got so mad, but I was just joking with him, I was trying to be funny. And I thought I was about to fight him. Come on, man, pipe down. But the prophet says uh, that he would be the one. Uh, look at that pretty woman walking in the church. That's my mother. Come on in, mama. Come on with your, I'm so glad. 81 years young. Amen. That's my mama right there. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. Now, say, well, maybe he was a false prophet. Well, I guess the way you determine that is whether or not it comes to pass. <laughs> That's bad, ain't it, mother? <laughs> so my, I wish you could see what I see, the way you were looking at me. Some of you are looking askance. I mean, I didn't prophesy. It wasn't me. The Lord didn't show it to me. Uh, and God probably didn't because he would have known. Had I said that in 2011, my congregants would have shot me. <laughs> and he knew that had, had he given it to me, I would have said it. Amen. You ever been doing like that little boy there? Just cry. Just cry. <laughs> But we serve a God who declaring the end, the outcome of a thing from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Isn't that amazing? Saying my counsel will stand and I will do all of my pleasures. That's Isaiah 46 and verse 10. An interesting note about the knowledge of God and 
his insight. Jesus Christ, being God the Son, had the same knowledge and insight. Interesting passage in John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. Says, now when, speaking of Jesus, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day. Many, listen to this, believed on his name. When they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. Now verse 23 says, many believed on him when they saw his miracles. And yet he knew that their belief wasn't genuine. And he knew that their endorsement of him wasn't real. I wonder what does the Lord say about our faith? Bless you, man. I wonder what does the Lord say about our endorsement? Is it real or is it Memorex? Is it real or is it fake? I tell you this, God knows. So when you talk to him, he knows whether we're real. He knows Praise the Lord, whether we mean the things that we say. Last thing for today, and there are many other things that I could say about this subject, about God's response. Always know this about God, that at all, at all times, in every situation, the God of the Bible is always, at all times, in every situation, in charge. In charge. Amen. He said this, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God besides me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. I, I carried you, even before you met me. That they may know from the rising of the sun in the east and from the west, as the sun sets, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I formed the light. I create darkness. I make peace. I create catastrophes. I, the Lord, does all, do all these things. God's in charge. Hallelujah. That's Isaiah 45, verse 5 through 7. For those who would like to look it up, he's in charge. And the context even of this particular passage was that God raised up, God said 150 years before King Cyrus was even born that I am going to raise up a Persian king named Cyrus. 150 years before he was born. And I'm going to raise him up and I'm going to use Cyrus to do the what would have been thought of as impossible, unthinkable. I'm going to raise up a man to conquer the mighty Chaldeans who were the superpower at that time. Upper room, our God is not asleep. Our God is not weak. Our God is not dead. Our God is is not inactive. Our God is strong. Our God is in charge. So we're well, preacher, I don't see God uh, being all these things in my life. And what do I 
need to do. Well, perhaps Isaiah 59 and 1 will help you. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. Perhaps this is the problem. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have caused him to hide his face from you. That you, that he will not hear. If God is not moving, it may be, you know, the good place to start may be, God, show me myself. Work on the iniquity that's in me and I'll get it out of the way so that I can have a move of God in my life. Can I get a witness? My mom a little hoarse from preaching at the clinic. I don't have a cold. I know her. I'm talking to her on the phone. Son, I, I can sneeze one time. Son, are you sick? Son, you ask mom, I'm good. I'm good. Amen. I'm, I'm, hey, listen, if I sound a little rough, I'm proud of you. I did it for the babies. Amen. Say amen. Say amen. amen. I'll be back down there Saturday too. Right back at it. <laughs> Isn't God good? Yes. So here's what you need to pray when dealing with God's response. Talk to the Lord about whatever. Say to him what's on your mind. Now Solomon did say this. The Lord is in heaven, and we're on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So are, you are you preaching against long prayers? No, I'm preaching against wasting time. Now, it's amazing how repetitive we are in prayer, which the Bible speaks against vain repetition. Move, Lord, move, 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 move. Move, Lord, move, have your way, have it, have it, do it, yeah, right now, yeah. 20 minutes later, have your way. Just have your way, have your way, move, move, move. Stop, Lord, stop. <laughs> the Lord wonder, what do they want me to do? Prayer is a serious thing. When you pray, say to the God of the Bible, after you've presented your petition, say to him the one thing that's going to happen regardless of what you want. Say to the God of the Bible, thy will be done. Amen. I want you to heal me, but your will be done. I, I want you to touch mama. I want you to touch daddy, but oh God, thy will be done. Lord, who did sin that this man would be born blind? His parents or himself? Jesus said, neither. But this man was afflicted that the glory of God might be revealed in him. Sometimes God lets you go through just for the glory of bringing you out. And, and see, and, and it changes you because don't enough, don't, uh, there's not enough of us uh, who appreciate God for bringing us out or for keeping us out. Don't nobody testify about being out. Everybody testify about having gone in and come out. Now a good way to stay, uh, to keep from going in is to thank God for keeping you out. When was the last time somebody just stood up and said, Saints, you no, know, I want to thank the Lord because I don't need a miracle. I want to thank God because he's covered so many bases in my life that I don't even need an intervention. No, you know what? I started to pull the wool over your eyes this morning. I just get up today and say, how many need a miracle today from the Lord? Depending on how I ask it, everybody will raise their hand. And you're sitting there, you don't have cancer. 
You don't have an incurable disease. You got money in the bank. You feel good in your body. You're employed. Your, your children are fine. And you're raising your hand to about, I need a miracle. A miracle for what? How about praising him because you don't need one? How about thanking the Lord for being so good that he withheld things? where you don't need that kind of an intervention. Every time we breathe, we inhale enough uh, carcinogens. We inhale enough disease to kill us dead. And yet God keeps us and has watched over us. Here's a good place for somebody to stop and just thank the Lord for being so good. Thank God for things being as they are. So we're to pray according to his will. Are you praying for me? So we find the prophet saying to God, how long? How long are you going to let me cry out and you not help me? How long? Why do you show me wrong? In verse 3, but you won't do anything. Let me cry out in verse 2, but you haven't intervened. If you want to study, I won't do it for time today, but if you want to study the conditions of um, the times of Habakkuk, study 2 Kings chapter 21. Study the wickedness of Manasseh. Read it when you get home. And then study after what happens uh, what takes place after the mighty Josiah is no longer on the throne. And you will see why Habakkuk was so disturbed. Let's deal with God's response. And then I'm going to get out of your way. When Habakkuk prayed, his concern was internal. He was concerned about Judah. Judah. He was concerned about what was going on in the southern kingdom, 8 o'clock class. But when God answered, God gave an international eschatological answer. For our God is a big God. Don't get so caught up and bent out of shape and worried about today's trial that's facing you. It'll pass. There was a song written one time that says, this too shall pass. All the other things have passed, haven't they? Well, this too shall pass. You, you got to know that the world is bigger than what you may be facing right now. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.